Scripture reading before this morning's lesson will come from Proverbs 1, 29 through 33. Proverbs 1, 29 through 33. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would have none of my counsel and despise my every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. For turning away from of the simple will slay them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will dwell, dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. Good morning. All right. Thank you, Nate, for reading that scripture reading for me, and uh, thank you to the elders for allowing me to come and preach before you guys today. Uh, Hopefully everything I say will be in a manner according to God, and uh, yeah, we have the reading here today from Nate, which was Proverbs verses 1, 1 verses 29 through 33, and I really want to focus here on verse uh, 32, which As you can see from the title of the lesson, the complacency of fools will destroy them. Harsh words spoken here by Solomon. Um, The complacency of fools will destroy them. So let's look at the definition of complacency first. Um, Miriam Webster reads the definition, a feeling of smug or uncritical satisfaction with oneself or one's achievements. So... We can have complacency in our jobs and careers, which we know we can be sitting there on the clock, watching it, waiting until we can leave, go home. We do the least amount of effort we have at work. We try to, uh, you know, make sure that we are comfortable at work, not trying to overwork ourselves, which can often lead to complacency in the workplace. At school, and I'm guilty of saying this myself, we can say to ourselves, C's get degrees. When we know we are perfectly capable of doing more than C's. And, you know, it's not always the case, but oftentimes we can think to ourselves, you know, we can do the least and still pass and we'll get our degree, get a job. But we want to strive to do the best that we can. In our health, we can often let ourselves just deteriorate. We can allow ourselves to become complacent. Um, Sports, same thing. Try to skip reps, skip laps. Don't want to uh, overwork ourselves oftentimes. With relationships, we often let let them deteriorate as well. We can allow ourselves to grow distant from one another. We can allow ourselves to uh, let relationships die without really putting effort into them. So let's look at some biblical examples of complacency first. We've got Moses, Exodus 3, verses 3 through 14. I'll go ahead and read that. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames from, of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush was on fire. It did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight. Why does the bush not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called upon him from the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here am I. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place which you are standing on is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of the people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign that you, to you that it is I who have sent you. 
when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So we see that Moses allowed himself to become complacent. He listened to the words that God was speaking to him, but he thought to himself, I'm not enough. There's no way I can try this. Now, we, if you know what Moses' background was prior to this scripture, he had become a farmer. He had fled Egypt and become a farmer. He is a, a tender of sheep, I believe. And he was living a sort of comfortable life. He was still, you know, obviously thinking about his brethren in Egypt. He knew what was happening to them. But when God came to him and said, I want you to lead my people, his initial thought was, I can't do that. He allowed himself, he allowed the fear in him to make him complacent. Now, obviously we know, eventually Moses, he went to Egypt and with the help of his brother Aaron, he led the people out. No, there were trials in the wilderness. They did eventually make it to Canaan. But had Moses allowed himself to become fully complacent, that would have never happened. Obviously, God's will would have played into that. But the example of complacency here is good. We don't want to let fear enter our lives and make us complacent. A more gospel-like example, we have the rich young ruler. We'll go ahead and read Matthew 19, 16 through 22. Now behold, one came to him and said, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, but the one that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You will not, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness Honor your father and your mother and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what still do I lack? And Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have, give to the poor, and you have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. We understand that the rich young ruler, he led a most, mostly faithful life, he loved, led a very comfortable life, obviously. He was rich, kept the commandments as Jesus had said, but he inquired to Jesus and asked, what more can I do? Jesus replied to him with, obviously, sell your possessions, give to the poor. The rich young ruler didn't want to do that. He knew, he knew what he was doing already was living a faithful life, and he thought he was doing enough. So when Jesus told him that he must sell his possessions and give to the poor, he, his, he let his complacency get into his head. He let himself be hindered by his own complacency, and it hindered his faith. And he was the one that had went out and asked Jesus what more he could do. And he still decided that he didn't want to do any more. So let's look at some causes of complacency, some frequent causes of complacency and how we can avoid them, especially through examples in the Bible. First, we'll read Luke 12, 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. Already we we're hearing very similar statements to what was taught to the rich young ruler. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to go to store my crop. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool. This night your soul is required of you, and the things which you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. 
So the rich man here, he thought he had plenty and could slack off, allow himself to be stagnant. Obviously, he says here, soul, you have ample goods, laid up for many years, relax, eat, drink, and be merry. God's next statement, fool, this night your soul will be required of you, and the things which you have prepared, whose will they be? And this lines up very well with the scripture reading that we had from Proverbs 1 and 32. Fool. The complacent fool. The rich, the rich man here, he's an example of um, why we need to be humble. Why humility is the opposite of complacency. If we remain humble in our spiritual lives, we, we won't end up like this rich man. If we don't be complacent, we won't end up like this rich man. Another cause of complacency would be lack of hardship. We'll read Revelations th uh, 3, 14 through 22. This is the lukewarm church of Laodicea. Starting in verse 14. And the angel of the Lord in Laodicea wrote, the words of Amen, Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold nor hot. So you, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For I say, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may be rich, and white garments so you, that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness, nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove, and I discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he will eat, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit by the, with me on the throne. And I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So here we have the lukewarm church at Laodicea. There's been, I've heard many lessons preached on the, uh, the churches. And um, I thought the church at Laodicea would be a great example because we have a church here that is faithful. They know that they are faithful but they do the bare minimum. God says they're lukewarm. They are neither hot nor cold. He uses the example of, for you say I am rich and I have prospered and I need nothing, not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. These people thought they were rich in blessings, rich in the spirit, but in reality, they lacked much of what was needed to be saved. Obviously, as the church here at Barnesville, we cannot allow ourselves to become lukewarm. We don't want to be stagnant. We don't want to just be doing enough to be considered a Christian. We must always be looking to grow spiritually. Solomon speaks more on complacency in Proverbs. Um, here's Proverbs 10 and verse 4. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. The complacent soul is a poor soul. We allow ourselves to become complacent and we create a lack of fellowship. We create a lack of faith. We create a lack of salvation. If we are not attending services more than just on Sunday mornings, if we are not going to our Bible classes, not actively participating in our different conversations about the Lord, we have, we create this lack of fellowship and this lack of faith. We don't want to allow ourselves to fall into that trap it can stunt spiritual growth we don't want to have our growth as christians stopped because we just don't want to do any more than we have to we can become numb to wrongdoing ephesians 4 and verse 19 they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality to greedy to practice and every kind of impurity this complacency can allow ourselves to become numb to our own sins can become numb to the sins of people around us. Bad company corrupts good morals, as we can see here in 1 Corinthians 15 and 33. You don't have sin to take over our lives if complacency sets in. Oftentimes, complacency, you think of 
staying in the same place. But that's not really the case. If you become complacent, you're going to fall. Complacency always leads to a fall. Merriam-Webster, the antonym listed for complacency, the first one, is humility. And we know Jesus was humble. We know a lot of examples in the Bible of people who were humble. And many a times they were the ones that were trying to grow the most. Humility implies understanding that one is not perfect. Let's go ahead and read 1 Corinthians 9, verse 20, or 24 through 27. Do you know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is a temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. We need to understand what our faults are, and we have to desire to improve and solve them. Obviously, even the Bible uses sports examples, so I'll go ahead and use another sports example. The Ohio State football team is not going to not train to try to get a national championship. They're not just going to get all these so-called five-star, four-star recruits from high school and just allow them to just sit there. They're going to train. They're going to work as hard as they can towards that goal. And we can use Jesus' example from Matthew 4, verse 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they should bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I'll give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So we have this example of Jesus who, obviously we know, he didn't have to die on the cross and he didn't have to do any of the things he did here. He could have turned the stones into bread. If he was hungry, he could have turned the stones into bread. But Satan, he tells Satan, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He took him up on the temple told him, if you fall down, angels will catch you. Jesus knew that that was the case. He could, have, he could have jumped from the top of the temple and he would not have left with a scratch on. But we know, Jesus says, Satan, you are not to tempt the son of God. Jesus is one of the greatest examples of humility we have. And given that we understand that humility is the opposite of complacence and we are striving to be like Jesus, we should look at examples like this and understand that he maintained this full purity with no shortcuts and no easy way out. And there are rewards for this lack of complacency that we have. There's praise for the church in Philadelphia for their works in Revelations 3, 7 through 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power and that you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make of those synagogue, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, behold, I will make them come. Be, be, and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you because you have kept shut, kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep 
you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. To try those who dwell on the earth, I am coming soon. Hold fast, hold fast to what you have so that you may seize your own crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write to him on, in the name of my God. And in the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, speaking of heaven, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. We know that God will reward those who diligently seek him as stated in Hebrews 11 verse six. And we see here the revelation reads with praise for the church of Philadelphia for their works and their faithfulness, striving to be better striving to grow and we want to strive to be like this church of philadelphia we want to strive to be christians like these people at philadelphia were trying to do the most that they could instead of being like the church of laodicea lukewarm stagnant they kept patience and endurance and did not become idle they progressed themselves in their own spirituality they pushed further and further to grow the church and grow their spirits. We, as a church, want to strive to grow in number. We want to obviously add members to the church always. We've been growing at a rapid rate, it seems, these past few couple years. We've had many baptisms, and we want to continue that. We want to grow in spirit and in knowledge of the word. Go ahead and read. Or We want to look at Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. We need more than just the basics of the word to grow. So we obviously know the steps of salvation here, Romans 10, 17. Believe, Hebrews 11, verse 6. Repent, Acts 17, 30. Confess, Romans 10, 10. Be baptized, Acts 2, 38. And keep the will of God, Matthew 7 and 21. This lesson was mostly about keeping the will of God. We want to make, keep ourselves from getting complacent. But there are those who are unbaptized that feel as though that they may already be saved for just being a good person. They may already be saved because God would never punish someone who is good that is unbaptized. That isn't the case. We understand that we need to follow the steps of salvation. We understand that we need to keep the will of God after we have been baptized. We have these steps laid before us. And God does not allow for complacence. He does not allow for being stagnant. We must repent of our sins and be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you have need and you need to come forward to confess your sins, or if you need to be baptized this morning, see one of the elders, see one of the deacons, talk to someone. We want you to come forward, and we want you to come forward as we stand and sing. Sure.